Hello magpies, and I hope you're having a good day. You'll have to pardon the lack of theatrical setup today. I don't think I'm going to be going with background music. Um, obviously there's no background, and maybe I'll... no editing either. Well, maybe a little editing. Maybe I'll chuck in some lightning, some fire, maybe a flaming skull, but that's it, that's it. No more editing, no more editing. So, I wanted to take a moment to talk to you with no script, just totally off the cuff, about the D&D OGL. It's something that I've been very reluctant to speak about so far, because I've kind of been trying to gather my thoughts about it, and, well, to tell you the truth, I think... As dramatic as it sounds, I've been going through the stages of grief over it. All week I've been in denial. I've been thinking about it like, oh, they have to come to their senses. No company could possibly be this evil. How naive I was. I kept thinking that Chris Cox, and yes, yes, that is the real name of the CEO of Hasbro, look it up yourself. I kept thinking that Chris Cox, he just has to come to his senses, right? He has to wake up and look at himself in the mirror and say, Oh, gee, golly, gee whiz, Rick, I had the wildest dream. I dreamt that I was making terrible business decisions, that I was a literal demon in human flesh trying to ruin things that people love for money. Well, if there's anything we can learn from uh, Elon Musk's hilarious but also disastrous takeover of Twitter, it's that CEOs and billionaires, they really are quite incompetent, stunted individuals. And um, it's a wonder they dress themselves. Well, let's be real, they probably don't dress themselves. They pay women with horses to dress them. But uh, I digress. I... The recent leaks I've been reading about the OGL, I... It's made me leave denial and I've been bouncing back and forth between anger and depression all day. And I finally decided to record this video, and I think that this video represents me moving into bargaining. Which is, I think, a good thing, because acceptance is on the way. So, why am I being so melodramatic? Well, I want to explain why the future of D&D means so much to me with a story that just comes from the heart. So, a long, long time ago, there was a period of time known as the 1980s. Perhaps you've heard of it. It was a long, long time ago. For context, it's sort of the period, the amount of time between now and the 1980s is roughly equivalent to the amount of time between the Weimar Republic of Germany that came between World War I and World War II and the moon landing. So I can only imagine that back in the 1980s, dinosaurs roamed the earth. I mean, I was, I was quite young, I don't remember, so I'm just going to assume that that's true. So, me growing up in the 1980s, I was a very isolated and non-socialized child. I was homeschooled, I never really interacted with other kids my own age, and I partially grew up in a hippie commune in the middle of the forest, you know, there wasn't really many opportunities for me to kind of find myself in the way that normal kids do. And as such, I was very withdrawn and I learnt to read before I properly even learnt how to speak. And so everything about the world I taught myself through reading books. I 
voraciously consumed world mythologies, fantasy and science fiction, and my favourite was Doctor Who. I never saw the TV series, I never even watched a TV until I was 10 years old, but every week I would go to the library and I would borrow seven Doctor Who novels and I would read one a day. Then come back the next week and do it all again and I love these books because they've set my brain on fire with the range of possibilities it ignited in me. It gave me it gave me a sense of there being a language that describes an inner world that opens up a whole galaxy of possibilities and those words have always existed inside of me. I just have to realize them and the door will open. So it was a simpler time. And then the worst possible thing happened. It was called the 90s. You see, people nowadays, they like to romanticize the 90s, but let me make it clear. The 90s was a mistake for all of humanity. It was a mistake for civil rights. It was a mistake for economics. It was a mistake for politics, for geopolitics and national politics. And it was a mistake for entertainment. Have you ever stopped and thought, really analyzed the movies, the iconic movies and media from the 90s, things like, you know, I don't know, Back to the Future or Beverly Hills Cop or something. It's the 90s hero is a man who runs around being as amoral as possible, lying to everybody and getting ahead. And then inevitably he has like some kind of a moral conscience brought on by some cardboard cutout woman who acts as the foil to his like, you know, amoral genius. And that was kind of the spirit of the 90s. And that's sort of what 90s kids kind of looked up to. We kind of remember the 90s as this glorious time, but that's just because of these cynical companies that flashed uh, bright colours and flashing lights in front of us in pleasing shapes to draw us into cartoons and video games with the cynical objective of draining our parents' bank accounts dry. Building an addiction, a brand. Oh, what's that? I'm talking shit about your fandom? Oh, aren't you mad? Guess what? Star Wars sucks. Now everybody's angry. So anyway, I digress. Into this world of the 90s where everything was awful. That was where I finally started school. My parents finally allowed me to go to school and I was able to interact with kids my own age for the very first time. And, um... Yeah, it was awful. Uh, being a teenager, which I was by this point, it is a very complicated skill set that requires at least 13 years of training. You have to know what to wear, who to talk to, what media to consume, media I had never been exposed to. Me, I just wanted to read my books. So you can imagine I was bullied very, very heavily. And there was no nerd culture back in these days. It's hard to explain to somebody what the 90s was really like, but this was a period of time where if people found out that you knew how to operate a computer, you would get beaten up. Yeah, it's kind of staggering to think about it. So anyway, that was my life. Every morning, when, every day when the lunch bell would ring, I would run the gauntlet of abuse to get to the library and I would pop open my, uh, my Doctor Who book and my brain would catch fire with the possibilities and I was happy. Then one day, 
I saw a couple of kids in my class reading, poring over a book. And this book was covered in pictures of fantastical robots. I didn't know at this time, but this was actually the uh, main rule book to the Rifts role-playing game. And the robot that caught my eye and my imagination was none other than the iconic Glitter Boy. For whatever reason, in this moment, I, enraptured, overcame my shyness. And I walked right up to these kids and I was like, what is that? What's that? It's a game. Can I play it? And before I knew it, I was in my very first D&D game. Now, as I mentioned, the 90s was a very cynical time. Everybody cared very much about very shallow things. I'm sure it is very much the same nowadays for teenagers in pretty much any time. But um, I particularly remember this period of my schooling as all the kids liked to pretend that they were dumber than they actually were because that's what they saw on MTV and well, monkey see monkey do. And um, everybody judged their self-worth by their popularity. This as much I know has not changed. And popularity was a consequence of the popularity of people you were in proximity with. So me being at the bottom of the social ladder, these people I played D&D with, they kind of resented me for being around them and such because by being in proximity to me, their popularity lowered. So I couldn't really call them friends, but when we played the game, it didn't matter so much because while they didn't like me, my dwarf fighter rounded out the party beautifully. And it was something incredible. We didn't know how to play. The games we had were awful. Nobody knew what they were doing. It was really dumb, but Somehow it was magical nonetheless. I was now in the stories that had enraptured me. I was creating a story. And the game didn't last that long. Um, it actually fell apart kind of because of me, um, sort of, you see. <laughs> so what happened was one of the other players decided that he was going to use his character to uh, bully my character in a way that resembled the way in which I was bullied every day at school anyway, except this was a fantasy game, so I didn't have it. So my dwarf fighter promptly uh, drew his longsword and castrated the paladin. Yeah, true story. So the game pretty much fell apart after that to fighting and arguing and such, but I didn't feel bad. So after that, shortly thereafter, we ended up moving to another town and I quickly found more people to play with. But um, this being the 90s still, obviously everything that happened was awful. Um, still kept coming back to D&D though, because it gave me that mind fire. It filled my soul with possibilities and the possibilities weren't the consequence of the rule books we read from or the game system or anything like that it was what we created ourselves it was well it was the third party content we were creating hmm hasbro hmm so anyway i had some uh if you could imagine playing the internet before, playing uh, d and before the internet was a big prominent force, uh, DMs were like, uh, you saw a good DM, it was like seeing Bigfoot. I never saw one. For the most part, whoever you found that you could play with, well, that was your party and you just had to put up with however problematic they were as a person. I played with people who used D&D as a way to avoid 
dealing with their serious mental problems. I used, I played with people who used D&D as a way to live out their serial killer fantasies. And eventually I played with somebody who had completely internalized the uh, amoral media of the 90s hero and had made it his basically entire life to manipulate and control people and he used D&D as a way to kind of draw me into a world where he had power over me and me being a very naive kid I well it kind of snowballed and I would be here all day explaining how it happened but the long story short is I ended up joining uh, several cults and um, Thereafter, I spent seven years of my life as a junkie. Um, basically spending every cent I earned on drugs. And during that time, I stopped playing D&D. But when I finally got professional help and started to get my life back together, um, D&D was there waiting for me. And the thing about joining cults is that the first thing cults require of you is that they, you cut off uh, connections to your support networks. So when I came out of cults and when I sort of came off drugs, got clean, I was even more withdrawn than before, even more socially stunted and even more like awkward and sort of afraid of human connection. And the only way I could reconnect with my family, with my brothers and sisters, was by running a D&D &D game for them. And that's how I started DMing. Like 25 years ago, at least. Maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'll do the math one day. I think it's around thereabouts. But, um, yeah, D&D &D had changed. And when I started my life and I went and studied history, I stopped playing D&D &D for a while again. But then when I picked it up again, D&D &D had changed again. And it had changed into something that was truly magical. D&D &D had become a renaissance. No longer did you have to put up with playing with, you know, possible future serial killers and... Uh, cautionary tales. No longer was every game an entry on the D&D Horror Stories subreddit. You could pick your games and critically D&D had become really popular with the queer community which transformed it, elevated it into something really remarkable. Well you see there had been a trope I'm sure you are aware of it if you've been in D&D uh, long enough, if you've been in the D&D subculture long enough, of young men who play female characters to, you know, uh, sleep around and to wear scantily clad clothes and to be like, ooh, look at me, I'm a girl. And it's generally sort of regarded as a fairly problematic sort of behaviour, but um, at least from my experience, I have a slightly different take on it. You see, I like to play female characters uh, when I play D&D almost exclusively. Um, in most games I play female characters and um, for me it's not like a voyeuristic thing, though the voyeurism and the idea of like, you know, when you're playing a female World of Warcraft character, for example, and you get to say, people say, yo, bro, why are you playing a girl? Are you gay? You can say, oh, nah, bro, I just like looking at her butt. And then you go back to your fantasy of, you know, exploring in a subtle way that you don't necessarily have the words to 
you explore your gender identity and your sexuality. And this was going on decades before we even had the language to, um, before the idea of gender exploration really entered the popular cultural discourse. It was like uh, we almost used the, uh, the radiant sort of background noise of misogyny and the expectation of the over-sexualization of, of female characters as a kind of a, a shield to ward off criticism. While we got to, or at least I got to, explore my gender non-conforming identity. And on top of that, it lets us practice socialization. Pretty much every friend I have ever had in my life, with a few notable exceptions, have been through D&D. &D. And sometimes I have overestimated the ability of D&D &D to bring people together. Um, I've played with people who, you know, I should never play D&D &D with. But it also has this incredible ability to... I don't know how to describe it. You step outside yourself. And the idea, like I was saying with the gender non-conforming stuff, the idea that it's all fiction, the idea that it's all fake and it's all make-believe, that lets you explore and do things that are real in a safe and non-confrontational way. So D&D made me who I am, being a constant part of my life. And now I find myself, I don't know, just angry and sad over what's been happening. I mean, it's not entirely unexpected. If I should show surprise that the world and all the corporations in it are run by demons in human flesh who, you know, fly off to Epstein's Island every weekend and delight in human suffering if it brings them money. Or if I'm going to be charitable, say, will allow human suffering if it brings them money. More money for more Epstein trips, certainly. If I should act surprised that that is the nature of the world, then, well, I guess I haven't been paying attention. And maybe, maybe that's the lesson here. Maybe that's what we can take from this whole disastrous drama. That we can no longer pretend that D&D &D is apolitical. And we can no longer pretend that it is just mere escapism and, you know, abstract descriptions of things that have no bearing in the real world. We can no longer pretend that it's make-believe. Kind of ironic there, you know, ironic turn of phrase I'm evoking there. We can no longer pretend it's pretend. We can no longer make make believe that it's make believe. But, you know, that's kind of a feature, not a bug. That's kind of the, the way the world works. Clearly defined lines aren't really a thing. That's just stories we tell ourselves to convince ourselves that we should study STEM instead of real sciences. Ooh, I did it again, I'm making you mad. Oh yeah, your math degree is useless. Ha 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 ha. I'm just kidding. Maths is part of the humanities and therefore it's very useful. Yeah, fight me, bro. Okay, okay, okay. 
I'm gonna stop taunting taunting the magpies. So maybe maybe the silver lining is that we can use D and D in the same way that we have used it to learn how to socialize and to practice and to explore aspects of ourselves that we represent through select characters, sort of uh, shards cut out of ourselves and molded into the shape of a character. If we can explore social worlds while solving, you know, dungeon puzzles, perhaps we can use D&D to solve social problems or at least practice envisioning what we could do to make the world a better place. I mean, it's kind of what we do already, right? Why do you think so many queer people play D&D? It's a world where you can be who you want to be and not be judged for it. Why do you think so many nerdy guys played it in the 90s? Same goddamn reason. We spend so much time trying to solve the problems of how do we make our characters more efficient within the action economy. What if we spent that time using D&D to practice solving social problems? And furthermore, what if we used our opposition to the clear psychotic indifference of Hasbro to become, use d d as a stepping stone to become more politically engaged. Because our games are political. d d is a game of power and politics is a game of power. And we can create the allegories we want to defeat in the safe spaces of gaming through the stories we tell. We can represent ourselves. We can represent a better future. But it doesn't have to stop at the table. Hasbro has made it clear that the only thing that they are willing to listen to is the loss of their revenue. So I do encourage everybody out there to cancel their D&D Beyond subscriptions and stop buying D&D products. And it doesn't mean we have to stop playing the game. I'm very sad about what's happening to the hobby, but I'm not going to stop playing. I'm just going to stop supporting evil companies wherever possible. It's just a drop in a bucket, I know. But at the end of the day, what is D&D other than an exercise in collective bargaining and a worker cooperative. What is a D&D &D table other than a negotiation and a cooperation? We have our DMs, but the absolute power the DMs wield is bestowed by the players. And I think that this is a beautiful model for how we could view our power. And I'm not just talking about Hasbro. I'm talking about wider political engagement. Now, I'm being quite deliberately vague here, partially because it is 1am and I just... 
I just need to go to bed and get this day over with, get this sadness thrust into the realm of sleep. But I feel something of my brain being on fire. With the possibilities, with the words that I can't quite reach yet. And I just want to say, oh God, I don't even know what I want to say. I just want to share with you my disappointment and my sadness, but also my hope that this is not the end. I know this is not the end. We will have many, many more stories to get to share together. We will set our minds afire with the possibilities. We will live out our, our internal worlds, and these will paint a path to a better world. And as we see ourselves do great things, we will find the mundane things leading up to the great things that we must do in the real world to save not just our hobby, but our environment and in some cases ourselves. And I don't know for you what gets you there, what gets you through the day, but for me, it's D&D. And whatever happens, I will stay here and I will be sharing my D&D with you, with or without Hasbro. And Chris Cox, fuck you. Thank you, magpies, and good night.